we would receive 1,800 complaints a year. About 96% were usually personnel issues, but 4% were significant, as it turns out. There was something going on that needed to be investigated. Well, all 1,800 got investigated, and there was a report written on every one of them. And a report went to the audit committee on a regular basis of the board of directors explaining what all the categories of uh, events were, and they were all investigated and taken into account. Corporate fraud works best in the shadows, behind corporate walls. How does the government bring these wrongdoers to justice? Whistleblowers. These are the stories of those who risk their careers to shine a light on allegations of fraud. Today on Fraud in America. On today's episode of Fraud in America, we're going to spend some time inside the corporate walls by spending time with executive Bill O'Rourke, who spent 37 years with Alcoa, a Fortune 100 company. At Alcoa, Mr. O'Rourke served in various roles, including CIO and corporate auditor. Since retiring, he has devoted his life to educating others about the importance of business ethics. We will also be joined today by his co-author, Aaron Miller, who is a professor at BYU School of Management, where he teaches our future business leaders about the importance of business ethics. Mr. O'Rourke and Mr. Miller co-authored the book, The Business Ethics Field Guide, and have joined forces to co-found the organization Merit Leadership. All of that will happen today on this episode of Fraud in America. Bill, Aaron, I really appreciate you guys joining us uh, today on this episode of Fraud in America. Um, we really haven't had anyone in your shoes before. We've had a lot of former whistleblowers. We've had top Justice Department officials. We've had whistleblower attorneys um, but the view from academia and from inside the corporate walls is a view that we haven't had before. So having you guys on to help us understand kind of the thought process that happens inside corporations, this view of business ethics and how it actually plays out. I talked about this earlier uh, with Bill. It's kind of this idea of swimming upstream. We deal with whistleblowers. <laughs> you guys try to stop that from happening on the front end. Is that an apt statement, Bill? I, I think it's very accurate. We don't talk about bringing people to justice. We talk about preventing that fraud. And it's usually driven by values in a corporation. You mentioned uh, how do corporations handle it inside the walls. I've seen two different approaches. One is sincere, where people really want to drive values in the organization. They want their employees to do what's right, and the leaders will stand behind them when they do that. The other side that I've seen has been a facade. Uh, they go through the compliance program. They have an 800 uh, fraud line number for the corporation for people to report fraud, of course. Uh, they do training uh, that, that uh, isn't very good in my mind. Uh, and that's all they're trying to do is prevent trouble damages in certain cases in case they get in trouble later. And I favor the ones that are sincere. And, and that's where uh, we come in and we try to drive uh, ethics as a skill. And there's a firm belief, at least from our group at Merit Leadership, that ethics is a skill. You can teach this if you're sincere about it. And uh, I've been fortunate that Aaron and uh, his, his partner, Brad Ego invited me to join them in the writing of a book. The book is called The Business Ethics Field Guide. And it's really a result of a lot of research by Aaron and, and uh, Brad, where they identified that there are 13 categories of business ethics issues. And uh, a category might be a person in a position of power orders you to do something wrong. What do you do? Uh, and they can deal with that academically. And then they invited me to put stories at the end of every one of the chapters uh, where I can bring experiences for my life into it. Uh, so I've, I've been fortunate. So I don't want to speak for Aaron, but he did a lot of that research and he could probably touch on a lot of that. Yeah, Aaron, this is a great question for you. you know, so I you know, was in, in preparing for today's uh, talk. I went through and looked at the list of 13 dilemmas. Uh, for me, this intervention dilemma yeah. comes up all the time in our world. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. It, statistically, it's actually one of the most common dilemmas. I would say the most common one is standing up to power. 
which has a lot of overlap with the idea of intervention. But the fundamental concept of intervention in that category of dilemma is you see something wrong and you're in a position to intervene. You know, I, I think uh, there's a lot of complexity and depth to that that can be totally based on the circumstances. But that's kind of the, the, the challenge of it is that each of these intervention dilemmas that a person might encounter are, are unique. And so the way we the way we give advice and approach it in our book is not to say, hey, in every intervention dilemma, this is exactly what you should do, because that's not going to be good advice for the majority of people. It'll work for some, but not others. And just like that's true for whistleblowers. I mean, there's some pieces of advice you'd always give every whistleblower, right? You know, you tell them to document everything, right? You tell them to make sure that they understand the problem thoroughly before they blow the whistle. There, there are pieces of advice you'd give, and we give that advice too. But then there are other things that, you know, do you need to go this alone or can you recruit help? Are you the right person to step up or should you be getting somebody else to, to step up? It, you know, you, you bring it to their attention, then they're the ones who intervene. There's a lot about each dilemma that's unique. You know, this intervention dilemma, though, it doesn't just happen in the workplace. It happens all the time. In fact, I don't know if you guys remember the television show, uh, that was sort of staged, what would you do? And it put people in public situations where they had actors, you know, acting out some, some injustice, right? And then they would see if the strangers on the scene would speak up and act out. The reason that show resonated so much is because people relate to that experience. <laughs> we see something going wrong and we wonder, man, it sh it, should I be the one who steps in here and does something about it? Bill, I came across this story that you told about when you were a corporate auditor at Alcoa and, and the CEO, I guess, had named his brother as president of European operations. And you were put in this kind of situation of deciding what to do. Can you tell that story? Sure. In fact, they named me the corporate auditor. When they did that, I wanted to know what did I do wrong to get this job? <laughs> right. uh, but you get to learn a lot about how the corporation uh, works, how the importance of control, et cetera. Uh, so one day the, the CEO uh, names his brother, the president of Alcoa of Europe reporting to the CEO. So there was a lot of talk in the organization about that. And as Aaron mentioned, whose place is it to step up and say something? Well, I, I was the uh, corporate auditor, which is kind of like the sheriff, and you kind of have an obligation to intervene. So I went to the uh, CEO's office and I said, Alan, you can't name your brother, the president of Alcoa of Europe, unless you get board of director approval and disclose it in the proxy statement. So he looks at me and he said, last time I looked, I was the CEO, not you. Mm. Uh, well, that's not a good way to start your conversation with the CEO. But he said, well, what if I don't do that? What's going to happen? I said, if you don't get board of director approval and disclose it, then your outside auditor, PricewaterhouseCoopers, they're not going to approve your financials, which is a death knell for a publicly traded company. Yeah. So he said, we'll talk about this later and invited me out of the office. Did exactly what I expected him to do. He called the outside auditor. And he asked them, uh, is what our work's telling me, is that true? Well, I'm not an idiot. I called the partner before I went in his office and made sure he's going to stand behind me whenever he makes that phone call. So sure enough, he did, he did call the uh, board of directors together, got their approval uh, for the appointment, and did disclose it in a proxy statement. There was actually a sentence. It said, Alan Belda and Rick Belda are brothers, and put it into the proxy statement. So I think we did what was appropriate in that case. Yes. And you have to be careful in the intervention. Uh, you can't go in with guns blazing. Yes. You better have some tact. And if there is a way out, you better bring that with you, such as get board of director approval and disclose it in a proxy statement. I love this concept of ethics being a skill, right? I, and I think that for a lot of people, it's the view that ethics either uh, you have it or you don't have it, but you guys come about it in a different way. This is something that can be taught and learned. And as a matter of fact, you've devoted uh, your careers to doing that, right, Bill? So why are you doing this? After such a long career in, in the business world, why are you now taking on uh, this mission? It was interesting. Late in my career, I was uh, asked to come to uh, the business school and talk about some of the ethical situations I've had in my life. So I started to document what I had. Uh, I had... Uh, over 300 uh, examples of real significant ethics issues in my life. Then my company sent me to Russia to be the president of Alcoa Russia. So in the three years that I was there, my list went to 700, as you wow. can imagine, when you're in that kind of an environment. So I get invited to share my stories with the students. 
And I think the best way to learn ethics is to deal with an ethical issue and go through it. Identify that you have one, uh, collect the facts, identify what the alternatives are, et cetera, and come up with a solution and act, do something about it. That's the best way. The second best way is to learn from somebody else. So if I have some examples that others can learn from, why don't I share those? And I really enjoy doing that. And you can see eyes open in the classroom. Uh, even people who are seasoned uh, executive MBA students uh, who are in the business world already, they can see through examples that I give them that they might be in this situation someday and here's how to think about it. So that I enjoy doing that. Aaron, yeah, you and I are, are, are contemporaries in, in many ways. We came up in the wake of Enron and WorldCom and, and everything that's kind of come after Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, business ethics, when I was undergrad, I'm sure it was true for you, was maybe an elective in business school. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't something that's on the screen. Now it seems to be required uh, of, of all students. Why do you think that change has happened? Uh, out of necessity. <laughs> I <Yeah>. mean, <laughs> I, I mean for a couple of reasons, I should give a deeper answer there. So, so number one, it is harder to hide fraud now than ever. We live in a world that's so connected that if a company has something happen internally, an employee could be tweeting about it five minutes later. That is not a world that we lived in pre Enron and all those, and, you know, and all those other scandals of that time era. Um, so that's part of it in the sense that companies have to be a lot more proactive. Um, and so business schools respond accordingly by, by teaching their students business ethics principles so that they can be better at that, be more attentive to that. And secondly, students are demanding this. They want this kind of an education. Um, part of it is generational. Um, students today, millennials and Gen Zs, want their jobs to have meaning and purpose. They want them to feel like they're doing good in the world. And so they take this much more seriously um, as a condition of their employment. And so business schools have to provide that to their students. Otherwise, students see it as a gap. They see it as something that's missing. And from the business school world, you see schools like, like messaging this. I mean, here at, at BYU, that is, it's one of our core messages that we put out to all potential students is that this is a place where you get not just an education that will train you expertly in finance or marketing or whatever your emphasis is, but also in how to lead an ethical career. And fundamentally, students want that. They want that deeply, um, more so even than they would take a, like a bump in salary. Um, and so, so it really is driven by those things. If I could add to that, Jeb, uh, yeah, I've been to a couple of uh, colleges and universities, and I'm not just getting invited to the business school anymore. You're finding uh, the law school, the engineering school, the medical school, they want to hear about ethics as well. So the best schools in dealing with this are the ones that have a standalone ethics course, but they also integrate it into the regular courses that they have uh, in the other uh, curriculum as well. You talked earlier about deliberate culture of ethics versus this, I call it window dressing. You know, it's, it's you, you, when you first get hired, you read something, you sign something, and it sits on your shelf never to be seen again, right? How does a company that actually really wants to do it the right way, how, do, how does a company instill a deliberate culture of ethics? My answer to that is it's leadership, almost in anything else. If the leader is a sincere advocate of doing what's right, uh, you're going to drive that throughout the organization. And they can show that, show that through the examples of what they do. Show it by supporting their employees, sending the message that I want you to do what's right. And when you do what's right, we will stand behind you. And I, I think when they do that, uh, that drives it throughout the entire organization. Aaron, in, in your research, um, what are some of the characteristics of those companies that do it the right way? Tone at the top is critical. Like Bill said, if you have leaders that are messaging a cavalier or cynical attitude about ethics, it bleeds into everything that happens. There's no company without culture. So it's not a question of culture or not. It's just a question of what kind of culture, what's in the air that everybody's breathing, what are people doing together? How are they talking about these things? And so the other thing you see is that companies are that do this right are proactive in talking about their values and giving people a chance, their, their employees, opportunities to talk about and apply those values. You know, if ethics is a skill, well, that means like any skill, it needs practice, right? There's, I mean, I can't sit down at a piano and play a masterpiece without invested effort. And that's exactly the situation. That's exactly the same with ethics. The problem is, is when it comes to talking about ethical values at work, 
it usually only happens in most workplaces because somebody screwed up somewhere. <laughs> and so you're talking about values, but in hushed tones <laughs> or in a private conversation with somebody, hoping that nobody else is going to overhear. I mean, this is really a form of practice. If you give your people an opportunity to talk about the values that are important to them in an open and honest and engaging way, then that develops the culture. If I sit next to one of my coworkers and I hear them tell a story about the time that their dad dragged them back to the store to return the piece of candy that they stole, a, a, a story that they might not tell without the right opportunity and prompting, then I don't know that about my coworker. I don't know what their values are around honesty, um, you know, around accountability. But when they tell those stories, when we have opportunities to engage that way, that then helps me know I can trust them and they're going to expect the same from me. And that's what builds that kind of environment in which people are practicing these value-based conversations so that it helps them have the courage in the moment when they need it. If I could add to that, Jeff, I find corporations that uh, live by legal compliance uh, and people that do that are gonna get themselves in trouble. Uh, the corporations that live far beyond compliance are the ones that do better. So the message I like to give is don't just do right, do righter. I worked for Paul O'Neill, who was the CEO of Alcoa for 13 yeah. years. Then he became secretary of treasury. He was the most enlightened leader I've ever known. And I remember once we were building a wastewater treatment facility in Mexico. And I went to his office to get approval to spend the funds. He asks a lot of questions as he always did. But one question was, does the city where you're building the wastewater treatment facility have a wastewater treatment facility? I said, I don't know, I'll find out. Found out that they did not. And for 15% more money, you could build a wastewater treatment facility that'll handle the water from the city as well as from our plant. And O'Neill said, isn't that what a good neighbor does? Let's do that. That's beyond what the legal compliance. And I think that's doing righter which is a hallmark of those corporations that really do it right. Oh, that's fabulous. There's a book out, uh, came out a couple of years ago called Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. Uh, fabulous book. And in it, he talks about that this idea of feeling like you're in a place of safety, that you it's safe to speak up uh, is one of the driving forces of good cultures. Do you agree with that, Bill? Oh, de definitely. Yeah, you have to have a uh, speak up culture. But the worst part of a speak up culture is you don't have a listen up culture on the other mm. end. So the employees start to speak up. And unless you have that listen on the other side and then act on what the employees say, it's not going to work. So it has to be both sides of that speak up, but also your leaders better be listening when they talk. Uh, on an earlier show, we met with a sales representative who was working at a company that was ultimately criminally prosecuted for sales and marketing of an opioid in a, in a legal way. And she talked about how the culture there was that if you do speak up, you're going to get fired, you're going to get fired publicly. And, and where I grew up, it's called hanging the coyote on the fence, right? You let the message be heard. You can speak up, but you know this is what's going what's gonna to happen to you. Um, Bill, you talked about this on, a, on another show. Um, Quitting decisions that you're going to confront two quitting decisions in your career where you're going to be confronting something that's going to be a fork in the road where you've got to make a decision. Am I going to do what's right or am I just going to put my head in the sand? Can you talk about quitting decisions? Sure. I, I believe we work for uh, uh, our bosses, but we also work for the organization. And we're going to come into a circumstance where this is definitely wrong. So when you speak up, it has to be corrected or you can't work there anymore. If you're really true to your values and you find that something is dishonest or, or going to hurt other people, you, you can't tolerate that. And you got to tell people, uh, I cannot allow this to go on. It must be fixed or I can't work here anymore. And I think we run into at least two of those in our lifetime. Mm. So, Aaron, this whole idea of uh, the leaders kind of setting the tone and making sure that people are aware of the ethics that are part of that culture. Um, how can they do that whenever they're confronting problems right now? I, I, I love this whole idea of the field guide, by the way. You know, right now we're, we're in, in a pandemic, trying to get out of a pandemic. Uh, there's heightened stress, heightened concerns. A lot of corporations are struggling if there's ever going to be a time where people are going to be deciding to rationalize away their moral ethics in the sake of profits, it's going to be right now, right, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that to answer your question about how do leaders do this, yeah, 
I mean, there's a there's a small, very small group of leaders that are genuinely unethical and cynical. And they're in a position of power because they sort of weaseled their way there. That's not a very large group. I would say the majority of leaders, the vast majority that are sort of falling short when it comes to this issue is because they take it for granted. They, they don't invest enough time into reinforcing values. And when we talk about values, we don't mean the kind of values that you sort of put on a webpage somewhere that nobody visits. It's distressingly common for us to see that. Um, you have to embed your values into everything that's going on. And that doesn't mean putting them on a website or even just putting them on the wall somewhere, you know, painted on the wall in your office, although that's not a bad idea either. Mm -hmm. But they have to be baked into every layer of decision-making, right? They have to be baked into employee evaluations. They have to, I have a brother, for example, who worked for a semiconductor company and they had a policy of honesty. It was a value of honesty is a better way to describe it. Well, one of his coworkers was caught being dishonest in an email but his dishonesty didn't relate to his job performance. It was just something else and he was lying about it. He got fired. And it was a reinforcement of the value because it was so critical. Like they, and it was smart, right? Because that manager knew, okay, everybody knows this guy just lied in this email and sure it didn't affect the profitability of the company. But now everybody knows that this person that they're working with is willing to lie. Yes. And and I know there was more to this story there, but that was the point, right? Is that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back is we can't have somebody who's going to be clearly and obviously dishonest. And everybody knows he's willing to be dishonest. These are you have to be thoughtful and proactive about reinforcing your values. And that case, that that means a drumbeat. That means it's constantly, constantly message. Because like I said, there is no vacuum of culture. And what that means is if you're not filling the culture with the right kind of values, then you're leaving it open to chance of what kind of values will fill that space. So you have to be proactive and deliberate about it. This, this leads to this uh, idea that you guys are working on over at Merit Leadership, empowering people with, in a sense, issue spotting so that they, when they recognize an issue, they know, they know how to address it, right? In a way that's ethical. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys are doing over there? Sure. So like Bill described earlier, the business ethics field guide identifies the 13 most common dilemmas that people face. And uh, and so, but it's written like a Willer's field guide. We didn't write it to be a book that you just read cover to cover, although people do that too. Um, but uh, it's meant to be a book that's there as a reference. Um, the idea is that if you're confronting something that's making you uncomfortable, it's probably because you're facing a dilemma. And it's good to pause just for a moment to define what we mean by a dilemma. A lot of people, when they think about ethical dilemmas, they're thinking, should I steal or not? Well, the answer is no, don't steal. But that's not because because that's not a dilemma. That's not a hard one, right? <laughs> dilemmas are when our values come in conflict. That's what makes it a dilemma. That's actually the root meaning of the word dilemma. And so dilemmas come when there are two things competing that are both good about what we should do in a situation. Standing up to power is a good example of that. My boss asked me to do something unethical. Well, I'm an employee. I've I've, I've, I've pledged a certain amount of loyalty, but I also want to, and I, and I want to keep my job, but I also want to be an honest person. I want to, you know, th these are examples of, of things that are valuable and important that are coming in conflict with each other. And so for people to really understand um, the dilemmas better that they're facing, one of the things we train on is helping people master their values. You know, I've done an assignment for over a decade now where I have students write a personal code of ethics. They're supposed to draft their own code of ethics that leads them in their careers. And uh, it's funny because they they get frustrated with me because they, you know, I don't give them a ton of detail other than like a word limit. Mm -hmm. And then they say, oh, this is ambiguous. And they say, look, if if me asking you to tell me about your ethics is ambiguous, the problem is not with the assignment. <laughs> right? right. The problem is that, well, you understand your own ethics, right? If you can't just rattle off the values that guide you, it means you need to work on those. And the reality is it's not just my students who struggle with that. It's all of us. Ever since I started that assignment, I've kept my own code of ethics mm -hmm. and I revisit it and I update it and I pay attention to it because those values in there have helped me make better decisions. And so being able to recognize a dilemma is recognizing I'm facing a hard decision because there are good things on both sides. That's what's making this a hard choice. A lot of the people that we work with uh, and a lot of the people we've showcased on 
the show come to this point of standing up to power. We talked to the GSK whistleblower a, a few episodes ago where she talked about how she was in charge of making sure that the company was making products the way they said they were. And they sent her down to do what it was supposed to do. She did her job. And then ultimately, they had a downsizing of one. So this this doing your job, but not doing your job too well is a story we hear way too often. But those companies that really are trying to do the right thing, and they don't want to go down the bad path, what should they do to these people who do raise concerns internally first before becoming whistleblowers? You know, they're raising concerns, trying to do things the right way. Well, they they do have to listen, of course, Mm -hmm. when somebody says uh, this appears to be wrong, that should be uh, investigated and you find out, is it true? And then take action on it. When I was at Alcoa, we had an 800 line where people could call and anonymously put in their complaint. We would receive 1,800 complaints a year, 1,800 that went into the compliance department. About 96% were usually personnel issues, but 4% were significant, as it turns out. There was something going on that needed to be investigated. Well, all 1,800 got investigated, and there was a report written on every one of them. And a report went to the audit committee on a regular basis of the board of directors explaining what all the categories of uh, events were, and they were all investigated and taken into account. If you can, I think you need to reward the people that raise the issue. Whenever they're really significant, if you can find a way to do it, not punish them, reward them, hold them in high regard, Uh, make make those the hero stories that become part Mm. of the culture of the company and and let these people know that it's good. I've become aware of some of the Enron issues, for example, and realized that early on, there were two or three or four whistleblowers that blew the whistle, then stopped. And I try to make the point to people, if you're going to blow that whistle, you blow it all the way. If you get uh, presented with a promotion or a transfer or some other reward, a bonus, you can't shut up whenever that happens. So you got to have the conviction at the at the beginning that I'm going to blow it all the way and not be bought off along the process. But if we can hold these uh, these people who raise the legitimate concerns in high regard, I think that's better. Just jump in on that because I want to emphasize a a leadership point in there was that the board was involved in reviewing those. It didn't just stop with a chief compliance officer. I I think, uh, you know, a board is is best positioned to handle these sorts of things when they get serious enough. And often these issues stop well before they reach the board where there's real accountability or should be, I should say. I mean, if any listeners are sitting on a board of directors, if you're not hearing compliance reports, whether or not they're resolved appropriately, then as a board, you're not doing enough. It should be part of your annual wow. process, at least, that you're hearing like from the compliance officer who's in charge of this. What are the reports coming in? How are they being managed? What are the ones of biggest concern? Because it's always going to be an example of competing values. It's always going to be one of the values for a CEO is I want to keep my job, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so if these reports come up and make the CEO look like he or she's not managing these issues well, then they're going to want to tamp them down. So boards need to be engaged with this. In fact, Bill, I would love for you to share your story, if you could, about the currency hedge (laughs) that involved the board of directors, because this is a great example of a board being engaged. And I just think it's a great illustration. I I can share some of that. In fact, I was corporate auditor when Sarbanes-Oxley was passed. Uh, Our position was, uh, if you remember, they delayed the implementation of Sarbanes-Oxley by a year to allow corporations to catch up. Well, Alcoa took the position, don't delay it, because we were ready. We were in such good control, and we thought that would be a competitive advantage. But uh, when I was the auditor, the head of our audit committee was Henry Schack. Henry was the CEO of Lucent Technologies at the time, and he was a wonderful leader. And I remember I took him the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley summary, and according to Sarbanes-Oxley, the audit committee of a board of director of a publicly traded company must review every fraud in the company. So Henry was telling me, I want to know every fraud and I want you to call me all the time. I said, Henry, we have people that are charging an in-room movie to their corporate credit card, and that's a violation of the corporate standard. Do you want to know about every one of those? As well, the the law says I'm supposed to hear about those. I said, you don't want those calls. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll bundle all those little ones up. And once a year, we'll come to you and show you all the little ones. How's that? So he said, okay, but then we argued over what's little. And I think we came to an agreement under $50,000. We'll bundle them over that. He wants a call. But I remember we had we were buying a, a company and uh, it was going to be a lot of money, billions. 
And uh, we had just hired a new treasurer and we were auditing the treasury department. And we found out that uh, the placement of the currency hedge for that purchase, which was billions, uh, did not follow the segregation of duties as is required by the corporate policy. Uh, so I get a call from one of the auditors. He said, you aren't gonna believe this. Uh, whenever you place a hedge, you're supposed to have the controller department determines the proper accounting. You have the treasury department picks the bank and then the back office actually places the transaction and you keep that segregated three different ways. So there isn't any problem. We found out the new treasurer to the company handled the whole thing himself. So I went to his office and said, what did you do? And he, he said, I was told by the CEO and the CFO to keep it secret. This is going to be a big acquisition. They didn't want the word out. I said, but you weren't supposed to handle it yourself. He said, well, I did. Yeah. So we investigated, found out there wasn't any improper accounting. They did choose the bank uh, objectively. So there wasn't anything wrong. But still, we violated the uh, policy of segregation of duties that I thought the audit committee ought to know about that. So on a, a Friday night late, I sent an email to the CEO and CFO, and I had talked to them about this. And I said, I am going to report to the audit committee next Tuesday that we didn't follow segregation of duties on this big mm -hmm. currency hedge. I didn't say, what do you think about, or let's discuss. I said, I am going to report to the audit committee. Well, I, I figured they'd have the weekend to think about that and they could settle down. No, I got an email back in five seconds that said, be in my office from the CEO, be in my office at eight o'clock on Monday morning. I was there. We had a meeting that lasted about eight seconds. He said, you've got to do what you've got to do. But if there's any discussion of that item, I'll handle it, not you. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. I said, yes. Uh, I reported on the item. There was discussion. He handled it, not me, uh, at, the, at the meeting. At the end of an audit committee meeting, they invite everybody out, and then they have a private meeting with the outside auditor. And during that meeting, uh, they asked the outside auditor, how's it work doing in the job? He's only been there for a while. He said, how's he doing? He said, he just reported on something he didn't have to tell you, but he did. He said, that's the kind of guy you want in that job. Wow. A person that tells you things like that. Yes. He said, he, he put his uh, career at risk. He's ratting on the CEO and the CFO. So I came in the meeting next, my private meeting. I didn't know what had transpired before. And they're telling, Bill, you're doing a good job. Keep up the good work. And I'm wondering, what's this all about? But then we reconvene. Everybody comes back together. And Henry Shack was pretty sharp. And he kind of had my back and made a little speech in the meeting. He said, uh, he said, uh, Alan Belda, the uh, CEO, he said, you run a wonderful organization. You've created a tone here where a person like Bill can feel free to come in here and tell us something that he didn't have to, but he did. So you can see the CEO is real proud of himself that he, he uh, is creating this wonderful environment in the company. But isn't that nice that the head of the audit committee kind of had my back? <laughs> Now, it did get sent to Russia a couple months later. But <laughs> I was going to say, didn't you go to Russia next? <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. That's a great story, Bill. Um, you know, so when I think about leaders, uh, it's, it's within their job resp responsibilities to intervene, right? I mean, we talk about intervention dilemmas, but that's just part of their jobs. Or, yeah, yeah that, right, Bill. <laughs> that, that's a point I make all the time. Leaders yeah, have yeah. an obligation to intervene. To intervene. If you right. see people telling off color jokes, mistreating people, anything. You got to intervene, intervene now. Uh, yeah. You don't call a meeting and discuss what you're going to do. That, you, that should be your job every day. As Aaron said earlier, intervention happens all the time, every day. And the good leaders, they're intervening positively with reinforcement to teach people the right way. Right. So, Aaron, uh, as we wrap up here, I, I had a question for you. Are you optimistic about where we are heading as far as a country, as corporate America, as the corporate world? Is ethics becoming a skill that people are actually are practicing or are we back to the window dressing of the 1990s? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I joke all the time when I tell people I'm in ethics, I joke all the time that I'm in a growth industry. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, but I mean that in both ways. I, I think I think the opportunity for harm is greater. There's more and more power to, to hurt people than ever before with unethical behavior. Um, but I think there is also rising with it a group of people, a, a whole generation of people, in fact, who want to make sure the right things happen. You know, employee citizenship is a thing now that has never been before where employees are are, are sort of collaborating and demanding more of their bosses about how a company is managed. 
um, that's, that's just one example of this sign that people are moving more and more towards this. Now, the question of whether or not people are seeing ethics as a skill more, I'm not sure that that's true. And that's why we're fighting the fight we are. That's why we're doing what we do. And, you know, it's funny because we treat all these other things as skills, like, like leadership. We talk about it as a skill. Communication is a skill that we can practice and train people on. It's crazy to me that we don't think of ethics that way because people find hard situations all the time where they don't know what to do. Good people. I mean, that's one thing our research showed we we read hundreds of ethical dilemmas real dilemmas that people faced at work and we know the endings to these stories because they shared with us and that luckily for us they were very frank in sharing what happened and many many of them made mistakes in the way they dealt with their dilemma but what we saw over and over again was that these were good people i mean it was evident from the way they talked about their dilemmas the way they talked about their mistake and managing it they knew it was a mistake but they still did it that's not a character failure that is a skill failure. And so the idea that ethics is a skill is something that needs to be messaged much more broadly, much more proactively. Managers need to see it that way. At the, uh, training needs to be more than just compliance. It's one thing to teach people what to do. It's entirely something else to teach them how to do it. So I do think you've got a whole bunch of great intention moving the right direction. Skills are going to be the things that bridge that intention to good outcomes. Bill, for you, um, you know, there very likely is someone listening to today's show uh, that's working at a company where even if they do recognize ethics as a skill, they have no interest in learning that skill. And uh, the company has been hijacked maybe by an executive who uh, is driving the company in a bad direction, maybe unbeknownst to the board. What, what would you say to that individual? Uh, I would say first focus on uh, your area or sphere of influence. You would be in uh, usually in a work group, sometimes in a department, and you can affect what goes on in that area and try to ignore uh, as much as you can uh, what's going on in other areas and build uh, that strong culture within the work group that you have. And then you'll find out that you'll gain a reputation for integrity and honesty, and that's going to serve you well. In fact, I believe integrity is the most uh, valuable asset of a true leader. And if you develop a reputation for integrity, you're going to get other opportunities. Now you're going to be able to influence a company and then maybe a corporation. So stick with it uh, unless it gets really out of hand. If you find dishonesty in other areas, that might become one of your quitting decisions. And you have to find another place where you're going to practice your skills and develop them. Uh, but otherwise, focus on your sphere of influence. You have enough there to be able to build a culture and you'll find it'll become contagious. And other people will want uh, to build that kind of a culture in the company. Bill, Aaron, I, I appreciate you guys working upstream from us, uh, stopping fraud from happening by making sure that people are practicing ethics as a skill and, and putting in place uh, programs that actually work and then, uh, actually bring deliberate compliance and ethics to the world. Uh, thank you for spending time with us today. I appreciate uh, you uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. So Thanks for the opportunity. What a story. Today's time with Bill O'Rourke, longtime executive at Alcoa, and Professor Aaron Miller was enlightening, inspiring, and very telling, right? That this is a, a world in which corporations have a decision to make. Are they going to put in place compliance programs that simply check a box, or are they going to put in place deliberate compliance programs that embrace business ethics. For those listeners who find themselves at companies that do not take compliance seriously, that laugh at the idea of business ethics, there, of course, are other options available, including whistleblowing. But for those corporations that look to step forward and step up when it comes to doing the right thing, I encourage you to reach out to Bill O'Rourke and Professor Aaron Miller at Merit Leadership. You want to join us next week when I'm joined by a whistleblower attorney as we talk about what whistleblowers can do, should do, and most importantly, should not do when they are thinking about becoming whistleblowers. That all happens next week on the next episode of Fraud in America. 
If you believe you've witnessed fraud against the government at your job or want to learn more about these important laws to combat fraud, visit fraudinamerica.com. On our website, you can find whistleblower lawyers, blogs from these expert attorneys, and more. You can also find a transcript of today's show, show notes, a way to contact our team, and a way to chip in to make sure we can keep bringing you the latest on fraud. This episode was edited and produced by Rachel Brooks, and our theme music is by Connor Chaos. A big thanks to our staff and researchers of Jeb White, James King, Emma Bass, Jackie DeMar, Kate Scanlon, Brian Markovitz, and Max Boltman. You can learn more about them at fraudinamerica.com slash team. Fraud in America is a project of Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund.